he's given Jesus Christ, his son. Because he's To show why uh, the, the, the program indicated this might be a, a shocking or a frightening session. Not at all. Uh, it's really a journey, that's all. And we'd like to take you through this journey, gradually, bit by bit. I suppose it's God's mercy that he doesn't give us the full details of our journey before we start. The only thing that we're very sure about is our destination. And uh, this is something that I feel very strongly about. And I therefore feel that it's not hard for any Christian to follow the Lord, whatever he asks us to do, if we're sure of our destination. If we're not, we get very discouraged and upset along the way because we allow what we're going through to dictate to us. We even think if we're having a bad time, we're doing badly. Or if we're having a good time, we're doing well, neither of which may be true. But I believe the important thing is to know where we're heading. And it was for that reason that Jesus could endure the cross because he knew where he was heading. He knew the joy that was set before him. And because of that, he could endure the cross and scorn its shame. And so the journey must be the same for us all. I don't suppose any of us will be called to less than he walked. In his mercy, he calls us to a place in heaven and he also asks us to share his death. And what I want to share today is a little bit of my journey, uh, and during the course of which he has uh, allowed me to see what's happening in other people's lives and sometimes become part of them. But uh, in sharing this story, uh, I suppose it's, uh, it's a little unfair because what you're hearing is uh, over 20 years being told in a very short space of time. And uh, people often say, well, you know, you never talk about the failures. You never talk about the hard times. Well, you know that uh, place in scripture where it talks about uh, a woman in childbirth and uh, doubtless those who have uh, may affirm that it's painful to give birth but I never hear my twin sister talking about her birth pains I only ever hear her talking about her beautiful children so sure there's pain along the way not many failures, 
because uh, if you're working in the name of the Lord, he uses everything that you do. And I believe his measure of success is not ours at all. It's different. So it's painful. So there are dark times. So there are a lot of people that we love and it doesn't look as if they're working out that well. Yes. We want to be honest and tell you that this happens. We want to be honest and say we don't understand it all. But we are committed to going on learning. And we're committed to going on trying with those people that it doesn't look as if we've yet reached. But actually, we don't want to spend a lot of time on all of that. We're just trying to be honest in telling you that that happens. But we'd prefer to tell you about the beautiful children, the nice babies that have been born. Because that's why, in his mercy, God's left us here. I want to read you from Psalm 107. There are several psalms which we call addict psalms or poor people psalms, and this is one of them. You could call this the psalm of the homeless. Give thanks to the Lord for his good, his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from north from east and from west and the, from the south. What we have now in Hong Kong is, uh, we'll show you some pictures in a minute, we have one particular place which has been lent to us by the government, which is like a picture of the kingdom of God. And we have people from north and south and west and east. We have people from uh, America, uh, India, Philippines, Africa, New Zealand, China, Indonesia, all living together. We have people who were made homeless because they went to hospital, and when they came out, their families didn't want them because they were too difficult to look after, or in one case, the girl smelt, so her family wouldn't have her. We have people who've been found under flyovers, they sleep under bridges. One young man who, whose father rejected him when he was young because he had polio and was therefore useless, and he trussed him up in wire and hung him from the ceiling and beat him. So he came to live with us. We have children whose parents are coming off drugs with us, and, and some of the children, their parents are still in the streets, and we've taken them to look after them, some with no parents. And we also have old ladies who've started again. And I'll, I'll talk about one later who's nearly 70 and spent um, nearly 50 of those years on heroin and as a prostitute. We've got old men. There's a sweet old man who lived in the streets for 40 years, I think. And he said he was looking for a home all that time. He was looking. And uh, he's lovely. We, we gave him a Christmas stocking the year before last, and he wore it as a hat for six months. <laughs> and uh, for all of us, it's a kind of home. It's only a kind of home. It's not our final one, definitely not. We're looking forward to a much better one. We've got uh, 12 tin huts, well we had, but um, since we left Hong Kong, there have been four fires, so we don't know how many are still left. And they're long tin huts that have been lent to us, and uh, we, we all live together. Uh, a wonderful collection, quite a high percentage have come through our various different houses to come off drugs. And uh, they come to live at this place to be further trained in the work of the gospel 
and in other practical training. But there's no difference between us. In, uh, in our work in Hong Kong, we don't have uh, staff. Uh, we don't have a leadership team even. Um, because um, we have noticed that um, there's not much difference between us and those people that we went to help. And so we found that we can learn a lot together. And we have different problems that we're learning how to overcome. But all of us really are there for one reason. It's because we, we want to practice uh, living in Jesus and making him known to other people. So we are from all over the place. And it's a kind of temporary home, but we're glad it's tin because we can't make it too beautiful. And everything that we do there is, our criteria is, can we move it when we leave? So the place that we worship and the place that we cook and the places that we sleep, everything has to be movable because we feel very much that we're on a journey only. This is not our landing up place. And this is a pretty good play, uh, way to live, actually. It makes a lot of difference to the things one buys and the ways one sp spends one's time if you're living temporary. So this is the kind of home that many of us have landed up in. And here are some of the places they came from. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. When I first went to Hong Kong, uh, I was overwhelmed by the needs that I found there. And uh, I, I'd like to talk a little further about this to, tonight and tomorrow because I, I think that we can get so overwhelmed by big things that we truly have no idea where to start. And I saw hungry people. I saw children that couldn't go to school because they had to take care of the babies so that the mothers could go out to work. And I saw old men and old women who had to beg because there weren't old people's homes. and. Uh, if you don't have children, you're poor because your children look after you. There's no old age pension there. So if you don't have children, you're wretched. And that, of course, is why a lot of people have children. So uh, I saw these old people and I thought maybe I could have an old people's home for them or maybe I could have a nursery for the children. And then I saw the teenagers and one of them he paid, it would be the equivalent of a pound, I suppose, a pound a month to sleep on someone's shop counter because there wasn't room for him in his home. It was just one room and uh, it was too full up. And he couldn't go to secondary school, although he longed to do so because his <clears throat> parents needed the money and so he earned so he could send the younger brothers and sisters to school. And I thought, well, maybe I could have uh, English lessons for teenagers. And if I taught him English, then he could get a better job, and uh, that would help his family. The needs were amazing, but so many that they're confusing. And I suppose they would be the same in Essex or anywhere in England if we're looking with one eye at least, I suppose we'd see the same needs once we start 
opening our eyes. Where do you start? I was overwhelmed, and I said, God, I don't understand all of this. And anyway, my heart isn't big enough. So, would you please show me where my bit is? That's all I can do, is my bit. And he led me to a place called the Walled City, which is um, very strange. And I had no idea that when I went there that it was an illegal city. I just thought it was uh, some quaint old Chinese village and everybody would be sort of poor. But I didn't know it was actually outside the law. And it was a place where uh, criminals, they got kind of mafia gangs called triads. Um, many of them operated from there or hid after they committed crimes elsewhere. And it's a very small place. It's only about a third of a square mile. And uh, together with some of the surrounding squatter areas, there probably at that time were nearly 60,000 people, which is a little hard to imagine here. Just a couple of fields. Um, and completely dark inside because um, there's no light. Uh, the, because it was outside Hong Kong's law, even though it's right in the middle of Hong Kong's territory, uh, the government didn't supply it with water or electricity until the people started stealing it. So they just ran a big wire in, and then people ran a wire off that, and someone else ran a wire off that. And now when you walk through the streets, you walk through with loops above your head, and under your feet um, are the sewers, the open ones. And um, everything sort of sits there till it rains. And it all sort of sloshes down. So uh, that was the walled city. And uh, there were, when I went, 32 opium dens. And uh, an opium den's very small, probably oh, only five feet by six feet, maybe. Not very big. You just, just go into a little room, and there's a platform there, a few inches high. And the, the platform is usually covered with slime. Because um, when you lie there, uh, when people take opium, uh, sort of stuff comes out of eyes and nose and mouth and um, all other orifices. So it's always covered with slime. There were 32 of those, well watched. And uh, there were not as many heroin dens, but they were bigger. You could get 100 people into one in a, in a tin hut. They used to sit around tables um, with a host at each table, even, who sold the matchboxes through which they inhaled the fumes. And for 50 cents, you got your bit of silver paper thrown in. As well as that, there were gambling dens. And they were usually swinging around about between 1 to 4 AM. This was the best time of night. And they were guarded also by uh, men from the triads um, who were called timantoi, which means uh, a weatherman or a watchman. And uh, their job was to stop government uh, spies like police on, or narcotics bureau or detectives from um, coming to spy out what was happening, or else their job was to clobber rival triads who were trying to take over the territory. So they usually sat with lead pipes under their chairs or, or their orange boxes, but they weren't very good watchmen um, because they, they'd usually taken so much heroin that they were what we call wume, and they were drooping all over the place. And then there were the blue film theaters. They call them uh, yellow films in uh, Chinese. And uh, very small again, a room maybe six feet by 10, filled with people. They used to import Japanese tourists, actually, to watch these. They arrived in Hong Kong, and they were given a mystery tour. I used to see them down the walled city following a man with a flag. And they ended up at these blue film theaters watching the show of the day and thrown in for good measure was a live lesbian show. 
and those were performed by girls who were sold by their boyfriends who wanted money. They were usually addicts and they'd have to live off the girls because uh, it was very hard to live otherwise. And the girls would expect this. They'd expect to give their pay to the man. So that was the scene. And the strange thing was that every time I went in, I felt really happy. It was very odd. And uh, I can remember the noticing it round about the second or third time. And then it happened again. And you know how you feel when it's your birthday, you know. I was feeling like that all day long. You know, I was going inside, mm, mm, and I thought, now what nice has happened today? Nobody said I look beautiful. Nobody sent me a love letter. Nobody sent me flowers. Why am I feeling like this? And all day long, I was like that. And I realized that every time I went into the World City, I felt like that, every time. And then I understood what it was. I was in the right place, that's all. It was a gift. So you see, I'm not brave. And I didn't need to be brave. The whole thing, as I've always said, was a setup. I was made for it. All I did was find the place I was meant to be, that's all. So it was not hard for me to be there. I wanted to be nowhere else. And when other people came through Hong Kong, other Christians, they used to say, Jackie, I'm praying about what I should do. And I always used to think, this is true, I used to think, why on earth are you praying? Don't you want to stay in the world city forever and ever? I mean, I thought it was the most wonderful place in the world. I couldn't imagine why everyone didn't want to stay there. Because you say, I always saw another city. I didn't just see the one that I've described, I saw the other one. And I didn't understand about dreams and visions and things, you know, people weren't talking about them in those days. But that's in fact what I was seeing. I was seeing the other city, I was seeing Zion. Every time I went down the streets, I saw a city filled with light, and I saw a place where people with no homes came home, and orphans came into families, and widows were highly regarded and looked after, and lame people leapt about, and blind people saw, and lepers were made clean, and the socially outcast were publicly welcomed. That was the city I saw. Now, I had no idea how to make one into the other. But that, you see, is the journey. And one thing that I feel very, very sure about is that we cannot make it happen. But there are some things which we are supposed to be doing anyway. And if we do those things anyway, God causes the other to happen by itself. I've spent years and years and years and years doing things I'm not suited to do. For years and years, I looked after houses where people came off drugs. This is very unsuitable work for me. It's absolutely not suitable for me, and I don't like it. It's not my thing, but I did it for about 10 years because it needed doing. This is just one of the things I had to work through, that's all, because I couldn't find anyone else who'd do it. So I had to do it before I could ask anyone else to do it. And when I'd done it, then I could tell them how to do it. Now I don't have to do it anymore, thank God. But I'm having to do other things that I'm not very suited to now. I have to work through them. Because they're there to do, you see. And I believe that if I see a hungry man at my gate, he is my responsibility. I believe he is. So for me, it's been bit by bit, one by one. And the first person who God gave me to start on, so to speak, was a, a young man who was working in, a, in the Blue Film Theatre. And uh, I, I'd begun to teach at a mission school in the Walled City. Um, I was teaching percussion band. It was quite funny. I, I used to play an accordion. And uh, I conducted with my feet. You know, 
and got all these little Chinese children bashing Chinese blocks and things. And I taught them 10 green bottles. And uh, there was this young man called Chan Wa Sai, and when I taught them 10 green bottles, Chan Wa Sai got sent. And I was very worried, you know, he got sent during 10 green bottles. So I, I endeavored to find out a little bit about him and found out that uh, his mother was a prostitute, his father was a drug addict, and all the teachers hated him because he upset the school. And then they asked him to leave. Well, I was very naive. You see, I was a new Christian out from England, and I thought Christian schools were to help people like this. So uh, I went to the teachers and I said, please, will you have him back? I'm really praying for him. And they said, well, sorry, we were really glad when he left. And uh, he upset all the, all the other students. He gave the school a bad name and the teachers couldn't cope. So I thought, oh, well, better do something about him. You see, I used, to, I used to think about him all the time. He was really on my heart. And I, and I used to dream about him and I really thought, this poor boy, I mean, he's 14. He started telling, selling tickets in a blue film theater. I mean, that's the beginning of his life. It's not the end. It's not as if he's lived a depraved life and that's where he's landed up. I mean, that's where he started. What kind of choices he had? No choice. And I felt he ought to have a choice. So I bought him a drum pad and uh, I used to go and visit him. And I can remember going down his lane one night and uh, I met a lady who'd seen me in the little church around the corner and she's a very nice Christian and she, she asked me where I was going and I told her I was going to see him and she said, oh. Not a nice person, very bad man, she said. And I discovered that this was the reaction all the time. The very sad thing was that those who really needed help were the ones that the places that were designed to help them could not accept. So I went on visiting him, and the church wasn't very happy with me because I was giving them a bad name by, by, seeing, by being seen around people such as he, 14. So I went on seeing him, and he was hopeless at drums. Never practiced, but it just gave me an excuse to see him. And it really was because of him that I thought I would start a youth club. So I rented a room, very small room, in there, and asked him to come and bring friends. And that was the beginning, that's all. It was for him. And he didn't come to Christ for 15 years. But then you see, for me, the point wasn't him coming to Christ. And I knew this might sound a bit shocking. But you see, I'd always teach people this. If you're going to minister Christ's love to people, and especially the poor, please never do it in order to get their soul. Because they'll know you're coming, and they'll turn away from you. You see, for me, it would be worth it. It would be worth ministering to that man for the whole of my life, whether he ever received Jesus or not. Receiving Jesus wouldn't justify loving him. Otherwise, Jesus would have waited until I said thank you before he died, and he didn't. He died for me when I didn't want him. And he forgave me when I condemned him to the cross. That's the love of Christ. And he asks us to minister in the same way, whether people come to believe in Jesus or not. We minister the love of Christ. Of course, if you minister like that, it's irresistible. They'll come anyway. But 
We don't do it because we're going to add up a number or send home a list of this month's converts, no. We do it because we care for them. And this they will recognize. I think it's the secret of preaching the gospel, actually. So I had the youth club for him, and he didn't come to Christ. So I kept it open several nights a week for him, and he didn't come to Christ. And I got to know his friends, and I got to know more of his friends, and they belonged to triad societies. And uh, by now we were getting thick in with the triads. If you want to understand who the triads are, it would be uh, fair to say, I suppose, that a triad must be a pretty good marriage between um, the Masons and the Mafia, very similar to both. Um, in fact, uh, a policeman who's a Mason in Hong Kong tells me that the hand signs, feet signs, and initiation ceremonies are almost identical. And um, <clears throat> it's a secret brotherhood, and they're sworn to loyalty to one another, and they don't feel wicked. They, uh, they feel they're protecting their own people, and they were protecting the uh, brothels, the opium dens, the two main gangs, and they more or less split the city between them. And I began to meet those people, and I was terribly excited to meet them. I mean, I was really pleased. And somebody said to me once, aren't you frightened? And I said, well, I mean, you only have to look at them. I mean, who'd be frightened? I mean, you look at people one by one, no one's frightening. If you look at them in a crowd, they are. But if you look at them one by one, no one's frightening. And I thought, this is great. This is what Jesus wanted us to do. He wants us to bring his love to these people. And more and more of them began to come to our youth club, and I kept it open at night, because uh, it seemed to me most missionaries went to bed at night and um, got up in the day, and most triads got up at night and slept during day. So I thought we should redress the balance a bit. Problem was I had to get up in the day as well. But um, it's been like that for a long time. And after a few years, what they said about me was this. Uh, which means, of course, she's cracked about Jesus, but apart from that, she's all right. And uh, this was progress. This was progress. This was after two or three years. And this is pretty good, you know, if people say this about you. Because, uh, as I mentioned last night, when we preach the gospel, I'm convinced that most people aren't listening and I don't see why they should. But they are watching. They're watching to see if we live what we preach. In fact, this is the way that most people understand preaching better than listening to it. So uh, they thought I was cracked about Jesus, but apart from that, I was all right. And I can remember walking down a lane one night and seeing a man with very, very short hair and uh, he obviously just come out of prison, and uh, he was saying to his friend, which is, that's Miss Poon, and her telephone number is 833179, which, and he said, next time you get arrested, to his friend, uh, ring the number, because um, it doesn't matter what time of day or night she'll come. And he said, it doesn't matter if you've done it or not, because they got arrested probably 50% of the time for crimes they hadn't committed. He said, it doesn't matter if you've done it or not, she'll come, but you must tell the truth, because she's a Christian. And I thought that was great, because they understood something about Jesus, you see. They understood that he'd come, day or night, any time if you called, and it didn't matter if you'd done it or not. But you had to tell the truth, because that was his name. So in those ways, you see, Jesus was being preached. Of course, the problem with the story I'm telling you now is the problem that any one of us here is going to find once we start sharing Jesus. You get deeper and deeper and deeper in. And what 
what you began with, you suddenly realize is not enough. Because merely to have a place for them to come and play at night wasn't enough. I wanted their lives to change. And then when I prayed to know the power of the Holy Spirit and I began to see this happen, I realized that they needed a safe place to grow up in. And the, the first one who came off drugs, that was a miracle. Um, it was as a result of um, a breakup. I'd been hauled down to the walled city the night before and uh, very early in the morning they had thrown sewage into the uh, room that I was renting. They painted it on the walls and um, broken up the chairs and windows. And uh, I was very disappointed. I also felt quite like a martyr. And uh, I said to God, well, I don't have to stay here. I hadn't been to a dinner party for four years. Well, God, I thought, I can go back to Kensington. Because in Kensington, we can have apologetic Bible supper parties. I didn't have to stay here playing ping pong with this lot who don't want you or me. And the Lord said, he's got such a sense of humor. When somebody hits you on one cheek, you're supposed to offer off the other. You know, there's so much in scripture that's not sensible. And uh, he also said, when things weren't going well, you were supposed to praise God. That's not smart either. But um, you're supposed to do it. So I, I can remember spending the day sweeping up all this revolting rubbish and saying, praise God, praise God, because you're supposed to. And uh, opened, opened the room up that night, um, and I was frightened. But I wasn't frightened of being hit. Uh, I was frightened of being rejected, which is really what frightens most of us. And uh, so I stood there, and this stranger appeared at the door, and never seen him before, and he sort of leant there nonchalantly, looking as if he owned it. And he said, um, you got any problems? And I said, <clears throat> yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Who are you? And he said, uh, Gogo sent me. Gogo is the name of the um, gang leader in, whom I had never met, the leader of the 14K. And uh, so I thought, now, why does Gogo want to see me? And uh, why has he sent this uh, man down? Because he's always refused to see me before. And he said, uh, Gogo says, if anybody touches you or touches this place, we're going to do them. And I said, oh, thank you. It's very, it's very kind. I'm most grateful. Um, please will you go and tell Gogo, you know, <clears throat> I'm very thankful for his offer. But um, I mean, I don't want to offend him or anything, but I don't accept because um, Jesus is looking after us down here, and he said, Jesus, you know, which means she's cracked. And uh, even though I refused his offer of help, uh, this man came down to guard me anyway. So every time I came in and out, he came. And then uh, one night, I said to him, oh, why don't you come in and praise God? And he said, okay. And he came in, and for three weeks, he'd been standing outside under Big Brother's orders listening very unwillingly to the gospel. And um, he came in, he started praising God, he started singing, and then he started praying in tongues. And the Holy Spirit came upon him, and he came off his opium addiction in half an hour. And I thought, good. <laughs> That's just how I thought it was going to be. I did, you see, because, uh, I mean, everything you read in the Bible's like that, why not? So, um, good, now I can go on to the next one. So I said to him, just like it says in the epistle of James, be fed, be clothed, God bless you. Stay away from the bad men. Stay with the Christians. Go your way. 
A few weeks later, we used to meet nearly every day. A few weeks later, he came back and he said, I really want to praise God. And I said, oh, good, why? And he said, um, well, I was in the opium den last night. And I said, hang on. Why were you in the opium den? He said, I was in the opium den last night, and I really wanted to take opium. And uh, he said, uh, somebody offered me some free opium, and I was about to take it. And then I remembered I couldn't, because I, I now have a new life in Jesus. So he said, I knelt down on the platform, and I sang choruses. Praise God. And I said, no, it's not praise God. It's silly you. You shouldn't have been there. It's really not smart to get into opium dens and pray to get out. Shouldn't have been there. And he said, I live there. And I'd never realized that. He actually didn't have a home. Uh, he kept his clothes in a laundry. And when he needed clean ones, he got out the ones that were in the laundry. But otherwise, he slept in the opium den. That was his, that was his home. And you know, I'd said to him, God bless you. Be fed, be clothed, be warmed. Keep away from the bad guys, you know. He didn't know any Christians apart from me. I was the only one. I was the only church he could join. Of course, it's not enough. It's not enough to tell someone about the love of Jesus and leave him half naked. The gospel says that we cannot do this. It's not enough to say, be fed, be clothed, be warmed, and not do it. So I looked around to see where he could go, and I couldn't find a place. And I don't know if you've ever tried this, but I dare say you will. And I, don't, I dare say I can't spare you the pain that's going to be involved, because it surely will be. Uh, but at some time or another, all the ordinary friends I've got in, in Hong Kong, I mean those who've got homes, I've used them all at least once. And not many people will, will, will let you do it a second time. I mean, who wants a just converted prostitute in your spare bedroom? Not many people. Anyway, there's nowhere I could put this man. Nowhere. And to get into a hostel, he needed references from two ministers. He needed a job. He needed two months down payment. And he needed a deposit as well. Well, what just converted junkies got that? I hadn't got the rent for him, and he hadn't got the references. So I took him into my home, which was not very suitable. And then his friend came, which was not very suitable. And then his friend came. And uh, we found the miracle in God's mercy was repeated. Of course, I got into more trouble then because... Uh, now you've got all these people coming off drugs, and we found that it was quite simple when they were open to Jesus, and we prayed with them, they came off drugs. So I thought, well, now I'll send them all to school. So I sent them off to school and sent one of them off to a job and thought, oh, good, got my family out of the way, you know, woman's are. And they came back at night, and it was very distressing to find out that um, they hadn't gone to school. And one of them had called in at a drug den on the way back. How could you do this, I thought. I mean, you're a new man in Christ, aren't you? How can you call in at a drug den on your way back from school? Or how can you not go to your job at all? I didn't understand this because new men in Christ don't put drugs in their arms. Of course, I had a double standard. Even now, I suppose it's the same for you. There are things in my life which I'm discovering I've never let God deal with, even now. And yet I expected things in their lives to be dealt with in the first weeks or months. And then I understood that they needed a safe place to grow up in, that they were new men in Christ, but in fact more accurately, new babies. And uh, you don't send a baby out to cross a road by itself. You keep a baby in a safe place with sides against the cot. And you gradually give it more freedom. You let it fall down a few times so it can learn to walk. 
you hold its hand crossing the road, you tell it how to cross the road, eventually you must let it cross the road you, it by itself, but you don't do it when it's a baby. So I understood then the need for a home where these people could grow up. Now you can see what's happening. This is all taking years. I'm getting deeper and deeper and deeper into trouble. <laughs> and I'm needing more and more and more and more help. You see, it wasn't enough just to feed somebody. It wasn't enough to clothe them. They had to be housed. And when they were housed, they needed to be looked after. And they needed to be trained. And they needed to be helped to grow up. So what we're going to show you right now is uh, the outcome of some of those years. And uh, what you're going to see now on the slides um, is a result of that. Now, I'd, I'd like you to understand this. Um, we didn't start with these buildings. People sometimes look at us and look at what we've got and say, oh, well, of course, if I had a center like yours, I could help all these people. And it's completely the opposite way around. For 18 years, we lived in tiny little apartments, which we rented ourselves. It's, it's quite the wrong way around to form a committee, rent a house, and then look for poor people. It's the other way around. I start by sharing what we have with them, not expecting the rest of the community or the church or society. We start by sharing what we have. And after 18 years, the government very kindly noticed that we were a bit crowded and uh, said, we'd like to give you these places. They're, they're temporarily given. We have them on the condition that we give them back at any time, which may be tomorrow or next year, we don't know. But that's fine by us, because we're only called to journey for now. So uh, what we're showing you is, is a result. It's not what we started with. And if you're thinking of ministering to the poor, you don't need any of this. You only need to share what you have. That's how you begin. So let's see them. This is the outside of the walled city. When I first went, um, all that land that you can see, which is bare, was squatter huts. It was a squatter village. Um, and they were also guarded. And they've been taken down during the last two or three years as part of a clearance program. So you can clearly see the outline of the walled city now, which looks like solid building. Obviously, you can see there's no wall. Next one. The Japanese took the wall down to um, build the airport runway. That's another outside. And in between some of those buildings are streets, but only at ground level, because uh, above the first um, story, the houses are built together. And uh, the outside walls are quite lucky, the outside houses, because they, they can get some sunlight by walking onto these balconies. All illegal. Um, <laughs> this is the rubbish. <laughs> um, on average, one room per family. This is the main uh, top street on the north side, which is all, s all false teeth shops. And that's because they're outside the law. It's the only place that's an upside down false teeth shop. <laughs> See the dentures grinning backwards. <laughs> okay. Oh, we need to turn that over. It's difficult to get your eye in, but that shiny bit at the bottom is, is a lane. And um, those 
bits of tarpaulin on the top catching drips because things drip. That's the street just on the outside. This is looking upwards at the wires which are tapped. This is just above head level. This is looking upwards in between two buildings. You can just see the sky. And there are post boxes, but it's a bit dangerous to send letters. <laughs> and the, the, the rubbish just um, is hanging around the, the whole street. That's a basket on top of a, a cannon an ancient Chinese canon. Oh, that's better. And this is uh, one of the factories. He's making rulers. Food factories, which you better not eat from. <laughs> and that's our meeting room. And this is where um, twice a week people who've heard about how their friends got changed, come in, and this is where they meet Jesus. They're lovely times, we're very biased, but there's nowhere, nowhere like it. We get between two to six new people um, every meeting, so I suppose that's between about four to 12 new Christians every week. And we go to eat afterwards. <laughs> and this is uh, Tai Tam. Um, a year after we got given Hang Fuk Camp, the government telephoned me and said, uh, we hear you need another place for people to come off drugs. What kind of place would you like? I said, what are you offering? They said, uh, what would you like? And I said, well, we'd like a house by the sea with its own private beach with a bit of garden. We, uh, we don't want it too far from the town, but we want it a bit remote. They said, hang on, we'll, we'll let you know. And two weeks later, they came back with this. We pay a dollar a year. And the week after we got it, the head of Hong Kong Shanghai Bank tried to buy it for millions and couldn't. And this is uh, one of our baptisms. We love them. They're one of the, the most fun things we do. And lots of um, their families become Christians at the baptisms. This is Dio, where we were given a, a second home um, just over a year after having the Titan House. The government phoned again, said, we hear you'd like another place. So they gave us an old school. All the places we've been given are in very bad repair, so we, we repair them, which gives us work projects. So this is a very pretty village on Lantau Island, um, which is built on stilts. That's one of the street going to our school there. It, you have to cross on a rope ferry. She does hand over hand, the lady the boat across. And those are the typical village houses. It's the road leading to the house. And that's the old school, which uh, has now been rebuilt. And uh, we have up to 30 brothers there at one time, coming off drugs. Oh, this is a new boy. We make them wear pajamas. It's easier to spot them when they run away. And <laughs> but they have a lovely time coming off drugs. Um, they pray in the spirit, and we have someone with them um, night and day for 10 days, and four days in particular, night and day, someone's praying with them every minute. 
after 10 jo days, they join the normal program, getting up at normal times and eating normally. Lots of Bible study, lots of worship. Lots of work. No, not enough work. <laughs> lots of games. And those are uh, some of the people living there. Um, with some of the helpers, some are from Macau, some Portuguese, and uh, this has been quite an outreach to the neighboring village where a number of children have come to know Jesus too. All of these um, men were triads, and I suppose the average amount of time they were on heroin was probably 12 years. Always eating. <laughs> They're very good cooks. Um, and this is in Macau, um, where we've just got three places now. And that's entirely run by our brothers who've um, come off drugs. So they started it themselves. They fund it themselves. They run it themselves. Macau is more serious than Hong Kong. Um, there's a great shortage of heroin, so they tend to inject lethal combination of um, pills. And uh, people lose legs and regularly. The government hospitals uh, are few. They won't take in addicts, so they're just left in the streets. tablecloth. <laughs> and this is Hangfoot Camp, um, where one of the brothers here is with some of the children who live there. Lots of dogs. <laughs> and we've got some Western families living there with us. And they, there in blue on the right is um, Elfrida, who's actually 68, I think, now. And she was a prostitute and on heroin for nearly 50 years. And she, when she came to us a few years ago, she was being injected in her back three times a day because she had no more veins in her arms and legs. And uh, she, her payment was three injections a day. She was still working as a prostitute. She used to sit in the walled city and solicit. And she didn't exist. She had no um, identity card, so she couldn't run anywhere. She wasn't a person. And she came in, and we prayed her off painlessly. And for a few more years after that, she had a bit of growing up to do. She was socially and psychologically about the age of four or five, I think. She'd witnessed two murders in the brothel, which no one's ever reported. And she lived in fear that this would happen to her too. So you can imagine there's quite a bit of growing up or someone like that. But suddenly, I wondered if we were going to have to minister to her forever and, and pray for her forever. You know, every meeting we ever had, she got prayed for. And I wondered how long this would go on for. And then suddenly one day, I don't know why or how, but she turned the corner. And uh, now she's one of the best ministers we have. And she goes, when we go to visit street sleepers, she's by far and away the best at praying with them. And the old lady, she's wonderful. And uh, she can't wait to go out. She says she has so much to be thankful for. She goes out and washes their hair and washes them and gives them food, prays for them, sees them healed. <laughs> Looks like an old gang. But it's a lovely place, um, this camp where we live, because everyone in Hong Kong has to live in tall buildings, uh, stacked up to the sky. But um, we have light here. We, you know, you can walk in between the huts, and we've made a garden. We've got a football field, a concrete one next door. 
and this is our sanctuary, um, it's two of the tin huts with the tin taken off the sides. And the army helped us to put a, a roof, a, a plastic roof, in between the two tin huts. So it makes an open air sanctuary. And we, we probably about 500 or so worship on Sundays. We also use it to eat and play in. <laughs> At Christmas time, we had, um, this year, we had uh, over a thousand people. We sent buses around the streets for Christmas lunch and picked up the, all the street sleepers and old ladies. And over a thousand people came to lunch, which we cooked on three gas rings. <laughs> it was a good party. And we have a factory, which Andy founded, um, which makes, sews, prints, designs, T-shirts, and other things. Oh, he slept in the streets for years, making tea towels. Andy will tell you all about this. Who's that? Oh, a hair cutter, right. So you can see, uh, you can see somebody standing there at, at, at the door. That, that each door uh, leads into a little room which might sleep between two to four people. So that's how the huts are, are divided up. That's it. What we haven't shown you um, is a place called Dai Po, which by the time um, I get back to Hong Kong, we should have started. We've just been offered 14 bungalows in the new territories. So we estimate that we'll be able to house uh, probably oh, 200 or so people in those uh, 14 bungalows. And we're going to make some available for Vietnamese because quite a lot of our old boys now work in refugee camps, helping, helping refugees. So uh, we'll have s some houses for refugees, some more houses for uh, the homeless. We want to have a couple of houses for emergency accommodation for street sleepers, um, more for addicts, more for girls, and some for families. So we, we've got the 14 houses quite well earmarked. Some sat in darkness and in the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. And then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. The whole psalm is about lost people. The whole psalm is about people who are wandering and looking for a place to settle. Now what you will already have picked up is what I found out, is when you minister amongst the poor, it's a long job. You see, it just isn't enough to say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. It is our responsibility to house them, feed them, clothe them. That's what the Good Samaritan did when he met a man in distress. He picked him up, put him on his donkey, took him to an inn, paid for him to stay there, bound him up, soothed his wounds, and left enough for him to be looked after until he came back. That's the whole job. And sometimes I don't know whether to be happy or sad when people bring new converts along. I hope you may be in this position one day, but I don't know sometimes whether to laugh or to cry because this is what happens on a Wednesday. Somebody meets someone in the street. Let's say it goes like this. Somebody meets uh, 
who's the fattest down there? Nobody's very fat. Somebody meets Alun, and they say to Alun, why are you so fat? And Alun will say, it's Jesus. And the thin one, who's still on heroin, is very jealous, because you know, it's very hard for an addict to get fat. So he'll say to Alun, I'll have him. Where can I meet him? And Alun will say, he's in the walled city on Wednesdays and Saturdays. So the thin one who's on drugs will come down to the walled city on a Wednesday, and he'll walk in through the door, and he'll say, I've come to meet Jesus. Where is he? And uh, so one of our old boys who's got off drugs will say, well, I'll introduce you to him. And he sits down, and he says, this is how Jesus helped me. Would you like him? Yes. Will you believe he's the son of God? Yes. Will you believe he died on the cross for you? Yes. They don't understand a thing. They just say yes, because they want what we've got, which is fair enough. And they just think if they say yes, they can come and live in our house, which is what they want to do. I think that's fine. So they say yes, 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 not understanding a thing. And so we say, okay. I know this sounds shocking. Just tell Jesus what you've said, you see, and we'll pray with you. And by the way, um, if you don't know how to pray, he'll give you a new language to help you pray. So they all at this point are baptized in the Spirit and speak in tongues, and they haven't a clue what, it, what it's all about, except that they've come to meet Jesus. And so they say yes to everything without understanding. I just, I know this sounds shocking, but you see, I'm more and more and more convinced that conversion is spiritual. It's not as logical as we've made out. We've added it up fairly well, step one, two, three, four, but very rarely are those verses together in the Bible, one, two, three, four. We've, we've made our little plans, which are helpful to people who think logically. But a large amount of the world does not think logically. They think spiritually. They understand spirits, powers, forces, demons. They understand that heroin binds them, and they've heard Jesus frees them. So they say, yes, 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 yes. You tell me those things, I'll believe. And Jesus meets them. They speak in tongues. And usually, they're very surprised. They get prayed for, and then afterwards they say, oh, I felt so peaceful. Oh, I didn't want a cigarette for four hours, you know. And uh, great. So they go home saved, or somewhat saved. And um, then four days later, they bring four friends back. Now, what would you do? Would you be happy or sad? I still have not made up my mind whether to be happy or sad. Because all I can think when they bring four friends back is, oh, God, now we've got to house four more. Because, you see, we have to house everyone who comes to Jesus. That's salvation. It's the whole picture. I mean, how can you do half the job? How can you introduce them to a paper gospel and leave them? You can't. They need somewhere they can be looked after, no love, no healing, and be trained and prepared for the future. So I'm still not sure whether to rejoice when they bring four friends with them. And the worst thing is that those four friends get touched and they bring friends with them. And then the next Wednesday, their mothers come. And sometimes their mothers will kneel even in front of me and say, Ponzude, Ponzude, please let my son be the next. Please let my son be the next. How can you choose? If we can only take, let's say, three new boys in a week to our homes, because they require a great amount of care and attention. If we can only take three in a week, and 10 people get saved this week, what are we going to do? How can you choose between one and another, especially when their mother's weeping, saying, please let it be my son, please let it be my son. I don't know how you choose. I haven't got the answer. The only thing we can think of doing is getting more houses so we can take more people in. Because the problem is that Jesus is so successful. 
and the more successful that people observe he is, the more people come and then we've got more problems because we've got to get more houses and this is why we keep on going and going and going. And this is why one man led to two, who led to three, who led to four. And they seem to require a whole lot more trouble and time than other Christians. But I'm not sure really if that's true. Because now I've seen that the whole thing was God's plan from the beginning. And it wasn't a lot to do with getting addicts off drugs. Not a lot. I think God could have done that just like that. He does every now and again. You know why he let us get into this whole thing of housing people, of having them live with us, of having them take all our nights and days? You know why? It's because he wanted to pick the best men in Hong Kong to be ministers of the gospel for the future. And I'm biased, of course, you see. I don't think there's anyone like them. I think they're entirely the best. You see, they haven't been educated. They have nothing to unlearn. They, f they have fresh minds. They're born into an experience of Jesus. They're born of the Spirit. And they learn very practically. They're praying for other people by the, by the second time they come to a meeting. They understand that they can be used in healing. And so these are the men that God is going to use in Hong Kong to bring revival to Hong Kong, to China, from whom we're going to learn more than I think, and Asia, and probably the world. Because God's plan all along, you see, was not merely that these men should be healed, freed, housed, clothed, saved, and forgiven, but that they should be the ones who bring healing, salvation, wholeness to men throughout the whole world. So having thought that I was in a ministry to the poor, I now understand that God in his mercy allowed me to be in something which was to be the means of bringing salvation to many, many more. And I'm now going to introduce you to some, some of them. And they're going to tell you um, what they do in their particular ministry. We will have a break at some time also, and we'll have time for questions um, after the break so that if there are matters that we've left out, I'll try to reply for you. So we're going to start with Chogin. It was very hard for them, you know. They've no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I'm working in, in Macau. Uh, There's about uh, 400,000 people living there in Macau. And it's a city that's full of uh, gamblers and prostitutes and, and addicts. And prostitutes and addicts. And the work I'm doing in, in, in Macau is to introduce these people who are taking drugs to Jesus. And what we do is to, is to go out, help helpers and, and the brothers together, we go out into the streets and, and to the places um, where people are taking drugs, and we also go to prisons and hospitals as well. We first of all will be to bring Jesus to them, so that they can be able to know where they can be able to find this family. Now, what is my family? We tell them that, um, that, that they can find Jesus um, with our family. 
咁我哋啊，咁我哋每一日咧，我哋都係啊，有我哋嘅工作咧，就係去啊，將啊啊，每一日都係啊，可以啊，都係去啊嗰啲醫院啊，或者係其他地方啊，去俾嗰啲有需要嘅人去為佢哋祈禱，或者去啊祝福佢哋。We also go to、um, hospitals and other places, and we pray with needy people who are in those places. 咁之後咧，佢哋就啊。好多時咧，佢哋會嚟我哋嘅聚會，咁跟住咧，佢就會上嚟我哋嘅家庭。And after that, many of them come to the meetings that we hold, and after that, will come in to live with us and our family. 咁誒，因為誒澳門嘅嘅地方咧係誒咁細啊，但係佢嘅教會咧大概係有四十間到。There's only about forty churches in the town. 但係基督徒咧係好少好少。同埋初初我哋開始嘅工作咧，其他嘅教會咧都唔係好接受。When we started doing doing this work, the other churches didn't really、um, receive us or the work that we did. 因為喺誒好多中國人嘅眼誒嘅嘅心目中，諗住我哋啲食白粉嘅人已經係根本係冇得改變。Because a lot of them believe that the, the, the people who've been on drugs, that there's no way that they can change. 但係我哋感謝主，我哋真係去用耶穌嘅愛去愛每一個人。But I thank the Lord because because He loves everyone. 而家好多教會都好接受我哋。我哋而家好忙，佢每日都有打電話嚟，或者叫我哋清潔，或者叫我哋油油，或者叫我哋去搬屋。And a lot of them are asking us to do things. We're really busy. Sometimes he asks us to move furniture or paint for them or clean for them. 我喺誒誒上一個月咧，臨要嚟德國嘅時候咧，我都啱啱先嗰一日都係做到晏晝。我先至收工先嚟。And even even the day that I left to go to Germany a few weeks ago, I was working until that 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 afternoon before catching the train. 所以感謝主都俾我喺呢段時間可以誒、呃、能夠可以誒、呃、即係接受更多嘅能力，同埋可以有一個休息嘅時間。So I want, I want to thank thank God for giving me the chance now to、um, to receive more of His uh, of His uh, 希望各位都為澳門去誒祈禱，多謝各位。And I'd like to invite all of you to pray for Macau. You'll, you'll get the bit about cleaning and painting later. <laughs> One time. Beginning, I thought that, that spreading the gospel was was good fun and really exciting. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do it, I was really excited. But when I got to do Something about this. Jesus is not how 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 Jesus served people when we began to understand that. Jesus is not how how Jesus served people when we began to understand that. Jesus is not how how Jesus served people when we began to understand that. Jesus is not how how Jesus served people when we began to understand that. Jesus is not how how Jesus served people when we began to understand that. Jesus is not how how Jesus served people when we began to understand that. Jesus is not how how Jesus served people when we began to understand that. Jesus is not how how Jesus served people when we began to understand that. So we began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to change the way that we shared the gospel. We began to
我哋見到有啲老人家係有需要嘅，要睇醫生，我哋會帶佢去。And if we saw the old people who maybe needed to go and see a doctor, we'd take them to the doctor. 或者有啲好窮嘅家庭有間屋爛咗，我哋會幫佢整翻。And maybe some of the houses were 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 falling apart and the people were very poor, so we would go and help them to build up their house. 或者有啲瞓街嘅，我哋會分享我哋嘅食物俾佢。And maybe with the people living in in the streets, we would go and we would share. 好奇怪，當你咁樣做嘅時間，人哋一定會問你點解你會做呢啲咁嘅工作咁蠢。It's wonderful because、um, when we started to do this, the people would would ask us, why are you doing such a stupid thing？ 我同佢講話唔係，如果我用我自己意思，我唔會做呢啲咁嘅嘢。I said, well, if it was if it was up to me, I wouldn't do this。但係但係因為耶穌愛你同埋我，所以我願意去做。But because Jesus loves me and Jesus loves you. That's why I'm doing it. 有時我哋去天橋嗰度去派飯嘅時間，我哋都係一樣係咁樣做。And so, some, sometimes we go out to the, the flyovers with people who, who sleep under, under the flyovers, and we do the same thing there. 啲人一樣問我點解你呢度咁邋遢啊？你哋都會嚟同我傾偈，全部又。And people say to us, this place is so dirty. Why do you come to us and, and talk to us and, and share Jesus with us? 好似耶穌咁一樣，佢唔係話淨係揾把口講，佢真係落嚟。Just, just like Jesus, he just didn't speak words, but he, he, he came, came down and died for our sins. 当然，传福音有时梗有唔开心嘅事，或者失望。And sometimes when we're spreading the gospel, we're not happy. We're, we're,、um, we're disappointed sometimes. 但系我睇到圣经里边，佢话我嘅工作只不过系做撒种嘅啫，生长系叫系即系长大系神嘅意思。But I see again in the Bible that, that, that our job is just to sow seeds, and the growth comes from God. So I see these kind of things. It's not just because of my own strength that God will help me. So I know that when we're going ahead and doing this, I don't. So I know that when we're going ahead and doing this, I don't. So I know that when we're going ahead and doing this, I don't. So I know that when we're going ahead and doing this, I don't. And and exciting. I find that I'm not joyful. That's all I have to say. Bless you all. Would you like a break? Yeah. Okay. Time to get a cup of tea. Shall we meet back at four fifteen? Does that doesn't give you time for tea? Four thirty? No, you won't come back, will you? Of course, the first time they come, people will bring with them many problems and much pain. 咁我哋同佢祈咗祷之后，佢哋会诶分享佢嘅问题俾我哋听，我哋为佢祈祷。And after we pray with them, they will begin to open up about the problems in their heart, and then we pray again. 佢哋有好多不同嘅问题，或者太太走咗，或者诶家庭破碎咗，或者有法庭嘅问题。They have many different problems. Such as their wife has left them, or the family has broken up, or they're going to court. They are very honest with us. They share with us because of these problems, they are not sure if Jesus can help them. And they very frankly share the problems that they're in, and also their hope or uncertainty that Jesus can help them in those problems. So we will pray for them. After we pray for them, we will pray for them. We will pray for them. We will pray for them. We pray for them, and after we pray for them, we do what practical things we can to help them. If there are some court problems, we will help them to the court and ask them to come to us here. If they go to court, we will accompany them to court, and we may speak to the magistrate on their behalf. They have some of them, about 10 or 20 years ago, they have no connection with their family and no contact. 
咁樣我哋咧就會去探佢屋企，去同佢傾呢啲嘢。Some of them have not been home for t e to t w years, so we visit their families and we help them to repair their relationship. 總之我哋係盡我哋嘅能力去做，但係我哋有陣時唔一定係做得到，但係我哋都係每一件事，我哋都係祈禱先。We do whatever we can、uh, to solve their problems, and、uh, sometimes we can't. But whatever we do, we pray about it. Because we know that the Gallows and the Gallows are especially for the Catholics. There are about 50 people waiting for them. So at least one month before they can enter. Because in Wall City, we have say 50 people at any one time waiting to come to live in our houses. Therefore, they may have to wait up to a month before they can come in. But every time we have a Gallows, we have a Catholic waiting. But just the same, every time there are people that come to a meeting, so we have new Christians every time. 咁啱嘅時間咧，咁我就會安排俾佢去啲新人屋嗰度。And my job is to find the right time to uh, uh, put them in the right house. 當佢誒去到新人屋嘅時候，係有十日嘅戒毒期，係唔可以誒同其他弟兄住埋一齊。係喺個新人房嗰度。When they go into the、uh, new boy house, then they don't stay with the other brothers for the first ten days. They have a special room. 係誒二十四個鐘頭都有人睇，係四個鐘頭係係一個吊。For twenty-four hours at a time, there's every there's somebody with them, and we have brothers on four-hour shifts. 如果一個撩波就一個睇，如果兩個撩波就兩個人睇。If there's one new boy, we have One brother accompanying him. If there's two new boys, we have two brothers accompanying. 咁到佢哋穩定嘅時候，十日佢就可以同其他啲弟兄一齊去參加我哋喺屋裏邊嘅節目。After ten days in the new boy house, they can join in the activities with the other brothers. 當佢我一安排咗佢入嚟嘅時候咧，咁我咧就會誒，我哋有個探訪組。Uh, and then when they when it's time for them to come into the new boy house, I liaise with the family visiting team. 咁我哋咧就喺呢個探訪組就喺佢家庭嗰度開始工作。And the family visiting team starts to work on the family。就啱嘅時間，我哋都會同佢嘅家庭去講耶穌。And they talk to them, the family about Jesus。有陣時誒、呃、受到好即係好好唔禮貌嘅招呼都會有。You could say that there are many occasions when they receive a rather rude reception. 但係睇到誒佢哋個仔喺裏邊改變嘅時候，佢哋開始慢慢去接受我哋。But you know, when the families see their son begin to change, bit by bit they will accept us. 甚至乎有啲家庭會接受耶穌，同埋將啲偶像誒打爛咗。And many families will also receive Jesus and throw out the idols. 呢啲誒人做唔到，呢啲係耶穌做到。This no man can do, only Jesus can do. 誒，咁當佢哋係喺大潭誒，唔係。大約喺新人屋誒，大約喺呢半年之內咁樣，佢哋就會過到嚟幸福營。After they've been in the new boy house for up to six months, then they come over to Hangfoot Camp to live. 咁佢過到嚟幸福營嘅時候咧，咁樣我哋就會誒誒，會好留意佢個恩賜喺邊度。And、uh, when they come to Hangfoot Camp, that's where Alan lives. Then、uh, my job at Hangfoot Camp is to Have a look to see where their gifting lies. 咁樣咧，就我哋會誒誒喺工作啊，同埋喺靈修啊，同埋喺祈禱啊，同埋睇佢平時佢做嘅嘢，我哋會好留意佢。I have a look to see how are they getting on in their quiet times? How do they get on in their behaviour? How do they get on in their work? 咁我哋每一個 relationships。咁我哋每一個月都會同佢祈禱啊，同佢傾偈啊咁。And、uh, every month I pray with everyone there and have a talk. 同埋會留意佢放假，佢翻嚟會點樣啊 ？And have a look to see how they're coping with holidays。如果佢哋嗰個恩賜咧係誒，我哋打祈禱都係啱嘅，或者佢嘅恩賜係傳福音啊，或者去幫一啲新弟兄戒毒，咁我哋咧就會鼓勵佢去做。So observing their giftings, we would encourage them, for instance, to go help in a new boy house or to be one that goes out to the streets preaching the gospel or other jobs。我自己都係咁樣長大。This is How I myself am growing up. But our 方法唔係一定每一次都係咁樣做 
but uh, it doesn't have to be the same every time. For everyone is a little bit different, so it's most important we pray about everyone. Many people ask us, what is your percentage of success? Very difficult to answer this question. I feel really annoyed when reporters ask this. Frustrated, sorry. Would you say if a brother was off heroin for five years and then relapsed, he was a success? He, the reporter will not reply when asking this. My opinion is this. If we are not each day in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not successful. Because everything that we have, we rely upon Him for. Yeah, you could say in our work, just like Anjai shared, there are times of uh, uh, sadness and times of uh, um, we just don't feel like it sometimes. But but anyway, we pray about these things. And after praying, God gives back strength to us. And through this, we learn even more. So it says in 1 Corinthians 2 9. Says that no eye has seen and no ear has heard and nobody could even guess uh, what God has prepared for those who love Him. So we do everything that He asks us to in His strength. What He asks us to do, we will do. At the right time, he will bring in the harvest. It's all. Well, you see why I'm very biased about our helpers. Kitty. In case you think we're all men. I have served two kinds of women. Um, one kind, they, their husband is come on our program. So they bring along their wife and their children. So I had take care of them. But that kind of woman, their heart is they don't want to touch Jesus because they think Jesus is their husband's God. It doesn't, doesn't matter to them. So they just stand outside the circle and then put a little bit the, the side, the, the, head, the head to see what happened about this group of Christian and about her husband. So most time we can't do anything. We can't give them a Bible study or a course for new believer. We just can do is pay for them and ask the Holy Spirit open their heart to understanding to know Jesus is her own God. Because they uh, most of them is come from the Bokkan family. So in the past, they don't know, um, haven't anyone teach them how to be a woman, how to be a wife, how to be a mother. So we need to live with them, stay with them, help them do the housework, um, take care of the baby, um, uh, 
cleaning the, the toilet thing <laughs> and, and live with them and show out to them how to be the wife, how to be the mother, how to be the woman. Um, they, don't, they don't trust in, um, when we give out the love and friendship to them, they don't trust in us because um, in their background, they never be, um, they never be, uh, someone will trip them. Uh, have, they are a hum, human, human being because they don't, um, their parents, their friends don't show up the true love to them. Don't, so they, they always keep close their hearts to don't, don't want to open themselves to the other. So we need to take a quite a period, a, a long period of time. Not just saying by words, by mouth, by saying. We need to take in action to show it to them. This is Jesus' love. We show it by action to show out to them. Um, love, the love not come from us. If it comes from us, we will run out. But we are for Jesus, give us the love and show it to them. And in another part of the world, had one kind of people, not same as their they go up their background, the people. We'll give them love. We'll care for them. We'll um, treat them a human being. We'll um, see them as pleasure, is worthy, and let them, their self-respect come back. Let them know um, between the one and another, we can have the friendship. We let them know. We let we treat them. We, we let them know we can we are their friend. We want them to be a friend. We don't just be a counselor or counsel ye. We are their friends and let them build up themselves in Jesus. Another kind of uh, woman, they are they are drug addict. They are drug addict and positive. You know they they just use their body to to sell and they don't understand um uh, personality. Yeah. they don't know what is personality so they they all or the other just look down look them down and don't um um treat them be a human being so they don't trust in anyone they don't they will when we close to them they will just keep a long distance with us. When we close to them, they will just, um, let's see, we will see you first, and then see what you're doing for us. But we will, I, I really feel you, just only Jesus put the, his love on our hearts, and then we show out to them. Let them to understand, in another part of the world, not the part they go up the world, they had a truly love. It really has someone loved them. And really, they are, look them, had their personality, they are worthy, they are pleasure, they are beloved, they are accept, be accepted. And then they can, they will walk slowly to Jesus because they come from that kind of background. They can't, they can't, uh, understand Jesus will love them they love them in that way so lead us to show out to them show out to them and let them to understand Jesus that Jesus will love them have one person have God Jesus will love them thank you Um, I was in Hong Kong for a total of just over two years and most of my time was at a new boy house so I'll tell you a bit about the first stage houses um, and sort of day-to-day -day program. Um, well like Alun's already said the first stage house is the next step on from the walled city and I find it a really it's really special time I think um, because you can see God at work so, so clearly, and um, I don't know. Like when they, just for example, when they come in, um, the guys, 
they're all really, um, they're just really new Christians and they hardly know anything about God and um, they're really weak and pale and thin and everything. And it's so good just seeing the way God changes them um, and seeing the way they grow sort of spiritually and physically. Um, as the weeks go by, seeing them looking stronger and happier and that, it's, it's really fun. And um, for, I think, I mean, I learned loads of things being there, but I think one of the most important things I learned was the power of prayer. Um, and I found it so exciting that God could use people like me and the brothers and that just to pray for each other, you know. Um, because I mean, a lot of the time, all it is when we're praying for the guys as they're withdrawing um, during the first 10 days, a lot of it is just praying in tongues. And it's so simple, and all it is is just making yourselves available to God. And He really does work through you. It's really, it's really exciting. And um, I don't know, it's a really fun time. Um, <laughs> um, I can't think what to say now. <laughs> what else is it? Um, well, what we do right during the day um, is just we, we always start the day with a quiet time um, reading the Bible. We have our own quiet time reading the Bible and praying and that. And then um, have a really short work program after breakfast, just a couple of hours, um, which we spend cleaning up the place or repairing the roof or doing a bit of gardening or whatever needs doing. And then um, we usually have a little worship time together. Um, in the afternoons we just play football or go swimming or stuff like that. <laughs> and um, in the me evenings we usually have meetings. And it's good because we all, we all do it together, like um, the brothers or helpers or that. We just um, do the worship together and everyone's sort of encouraged to to contribute, you know, to bring prophecies or to pray or to share from the Bible and that. Um, and it, it's good because, I mean, it, it is a time of learning for, for everyone, for the helpers as well as all the guys. Um, they're, they're, really, they're really open as well, open to God because they don't know much about him. They just, they're really open and God can really use them um, and speak through them. And it's really exciting to watch. Um, <laughs> usually they, um, they're in the house for sort of two or three months. Um, and like Helen was saying, um, it's just a t period when they're growing spiritually, um, just getting to learn about God and how to follow him and learning how to care for each other, um, that type of thing. And then that's when they go on to the, the main camp. I'll do. <laughs> I was privileged to um, to be in Hong Kong when when there, there, there was only twelve of us. I've been privileged enough to see it to watch the whole work grow in in numbers as well as in every other way while I've been there. And it became obvious um, after a while that we needed some sort of work for the brothers to get involved with, which wasn't just painting a house one day or um, putting missionary magazines in envelopes another day and another day having nothing to do. We, did, we thought that we actually needed something that they could get stuck into and they could learn some of the things which they hadn't had a chance to learn before. Um, many of them have never worked before. Many of them have uh, been in and out of prisons or other institutions. They've been looked after. They've been told when to, when to get up, when to go to bed. And we felt that they were lacking in a lot of the, the self-disciplines that are necessary for growing up. So we decided um, when, when we got Hangford Camp that um, we'd start a factory for them. And Jackie, <laughs> bless her heart, um, got me to go to a factory that was printing t-shirts for a month to learn how to print t-shirts and then set up a factory, <laughs> which we did. <laughs> um, the, the idea was that uh, the guys in the factory would learn how to handle money in the proper way, that they would learn how to get to work on time and how to work through the day at a job, that they would learn 
a trade which might be useful to them later on. And so we started up the factory, and we weren't very good in the beginning, I must admit. But, you know, God supported us. And looking back, I've seen all the time that it's been God's factory. It's been God's plan the whole time. God did all those things in the brothers, but he did something more that was, that was even more wonderful, I think, that we weren't expecting. At least I wasn't expecting it. So I saw their confidence in themselves grow as they worked. Um, one of the brothers here who, who, who's with us, I remember him when he first came into the factory, had no self-confidence at all. And through learning and working in the factory, you could watch him growing daily. Until now, he's doing what he's doing now. And I've just seen that in so many brothers. And that was totally unexpected to me. I wasn't expecting God to work in that way. But I think it's one of the major things he's, he's done there. He's, he showed his faithfulness so much in it. As I said, we weren't very good in the beginning. We had uh, so many claims against us <laughs> in the first year. It was unbelievable. But God supported us the whole way. We've got a friend who um, work, works for a large company and kept on giving us orders. He didn't know why he was doing it. He's not a Christian. But he kept on giving us these orders because he liked us. And we kept, we kept messing them up. And God kept sorting it out. There, there was two orders where one of them, we were really behind time. And we had to deliver the goods, and he was shouting down the phone at me every day, you know, where's the stuff? And we were, we were getting really behind on the time. And they had to get a second lot of cloth. Well, as, as it was coming from, from uh, the Philippines, I think, the ship sank with all the cloth on board. <laughs> and we had enough time to catch up before the next ship came. There was another time when, again, we were really slow on an order because we don't work to Hong Kong times. We, that was one of the things we're trying to teach as well, is that you can work, but you don't have to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, as most people in Hong Kong work. You can work, you can earn enough to live on, enough to give away, to share, and it, have enough time spare to do other things for God. And so we, we work slower than other factories. Anyway, so we were really slow on this order. And again, there was another load of ship, uh, another shipment of cloth that was supposed to be coming and instead of being sent um, to Hong Kong again from the Philippines it got sent to Portugal <laughs> and back and by the time it had traveled around the world we'd caught up again and these things that God is doing is making this other this other man see that God is real and he's beginning to 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 believe he can't believe our factory he can't believe how stupid he is in keeping on giving us orders but he does it and <laughs> And he's beginning to, to believe. God, God can use anything. Um, the guys now are running the factory by themselves, which is wonderful. They're, they're managing it, they're running it, controlling the whole thing themselves. And I believe that God's hand is in it, and it, and it will continue. minister to our own brothers, we minister in new boy houses, we minister to those in the streets, we started work in Macau, we helped to start new centres in Malaysia, in India, we're sending some to start new places in Philippines, in Sri Lanka, and uh, quite a number of our brothers are working in, in Vietnamese refugee camps. Um, because there's something, if you're a church growth student, uh, you may know that there's a, there's a distressing fact of church growth life which is called uh, redemption and lift and apparently this is what happens to poor people when they when the gospel is preached to them they become rich and they all go up a class they, they become um, more educated their social conditions improve this is a natural outcome of preaching the gospel a natural outcome, of course it would be, because people begin to live justly and fairly and enjoy God's provision and abundance. The uh, sad thing is, they get stuck there. Um, they get stuck in the class above. And we're determined to beat redemption and lift. So we're doing redemption, lift and send back. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. 
He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were gr glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. The psalm goes on, but it's a psalm about those who've been wandering and looking for a place. And of course, our place is still to come. We're merely traveling, and so we're teaching our people to be what I would call pilgrims. When you come to Christ, we say, you have not yet arrived, but you're merely traveling for now. And while you're traveling, you're free to use everything you have to share with those who've not yet heard about Jesus. So we expect that 100% of all the people who come to live with us are missionaries. We're not just getting people off drugs or giving them homes. We're training them all to be missionaries. 50% of them work in paid jobs, like driving lorries or caterpillars or working in factories. The other 50% are in, I don't like the term, but to explain it to you, I'll say full-time gospel work. Um, in fact, they're all in full-time gospel work. It's just that 50% get paid and 50% don't. And uh, what we do is we expect those who are earning to support those who aren't. And this is how we exist. And this is how we're preparing for the future, whatever it is. I'm now open for five minutes for questions. Um, we actually prefer not to comment on anything which might be taped about the future of Hong Kong. Um, so if you want to turn the tape recorder off, I'll reply. Thanks. Um, Do you want the video off too? Oh yes. <laughs> Smallest point. <no. laughs> 